This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible-believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with fifty million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone a sovereign god give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends rome today they offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today let me let me introduce myself a little bit. Uh, sorry, I, uh, hello, hello, Daryl. Uh, this is Michael. I'm doing just some lectures together with Brett and Jörg. And uh, pleased to meet you. I've listened to your interview uh, which you had the tel telcon with Brett. And uh, yeah, very pleased to meet you. Guten Tag, wie geht es Ihnen? Wunderschön, wunderbar. Uns geht's ja, gut. Eine sehr gute deutsche Aussprache. Sehr gut. Sehr gut. Ich Danke. spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. I was in Berlin, Germany for three years. Yeah, I know. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Great. That's wonderful, but for our English-speaking audience, it's probably more interesting to speak English. So, but then, <laughs> well, hey, yes. hey, one day, one, one day we can do a, a German interview with you too, Daryl. Because I, I don't know. Yeah. I could do that. Uh, I can speak some Russian and Arabic. Yeah, well, that's, that's, <laughs> those are languages that I don't speak again. So, <laughs> anyway, it's it's fine to have you, uh, Daryl. It's uh, it's wonderful to make your acquaintance uh, via the phone today. Uh, we have the twenty fourth of November, a, a Sabbath afternoon, and this is just the working of the of the Holy Spirit. This is how the Lord works. We were preparing. We were preparing a reading in the book, The Last Exodus, by James Edgar Wiley, and all of a sudden, Brett comes with the idea. Well, let's call Daryl in, and uh, so we did. And this is why we have today a phone call here with four lines. We have Brett in the United States. We have Daryl Eberhardt in the United States. We have Michael in Germany, and we have me, Jörg from Juggler Sixty Six, of course, in uh, Belgium. So, uh, this is my very first time that I actually speak with Daryl after numerous email exchanges, and he. I have to say, uh, make sure that I always have something to read, because since we got in contact, he <laughs> sends me an email at least once a day. So that's wonderful, a lot of stuff to read. But uh, you have to understand, if you don't know Daryl Eberhardt, and probably for the most people on my channel don't have such a good knowledge of him, um, I made one video uh, where I read a newsletter that Daryl wrote years and years ago uh, that was taken from a website, I think it was spirituallysmart.com, 
and um, that was an, uh, a newsletter that Daryl wrote to, I don't even know who anymore, but it's about um, how the Roman Catholic Church uses the Jews as an excuse to work their agenda. And I call that an hour of the truth, it's simply amazing putting out the information that the Jews only have the power that Rome gives them because we are living in the last times and the last times according to the prophet Daniel is the Roman Empire first pagan then papal we are living in this papal empire and I think Daryl is a wonderful person who can explain a lot about this because he has studied this all his life and because uh, none of my listeners really knows Daryl Eberhardt Daryl Please uh, be so kind and give us a little of your curriculum, as much as you want to state about yourself, who you are, um, where you stand today, especially where you stand on the Bible, and what what is your experience in life and whatever wh whatever you want to share with us. Please give us a few moments that my listeners and viewers of this video can get acquainted with you. And sure, welcome, sure. welcome, Daryl, to this conversation. I really appreciate that you can uh, spare the time with us. Sure, and I'm I'm glad to be here. And you know that we've we've got four heretics all on the phone at the same time, because <laughs> we're certainly classified as heretics. And despite all of the ecumenical, sweet, kind words of separated brethren, I think they kind of still look upon us as heretics. It would be my guess, but uh, I have a little bit of a a tongue in the cheek here because, again, it's really wonderful that uh, the four of us can get together on the telephone and speak together because I believe we all would classify ourselves as, as Bible-believing Christians. And we certainly are the type that uh, if we were all living together in like about 200, 300 years ago, they would be trying to track us down like they tracked, finally tracked down William Tyndale and eventually captured him. Uh, and isn't it interesting? It was probably a saint of the Roman Catholic Church named T Sir Thomas More. Oh, yes, that's right. He was got sainthood. Saint Sir Thomas More, who used to take like to take Protestants home to his home, his very own home, and torture them. And yet he got sainthood, which is kind of interesting. But to introduce myself is I've I spent tw uh, 20 years in the U.S. military. <clears throat> they were nice enough to train me in the uh, Russian language first. Uh, they sent me to uh, Syracuse University of all places with a contract with the U.S. Air Force, United States Air Force, and trained me in Russian language, and then they trained me in basic and intermediate Arabic. With I got a little course, side course in the Egyptian colloquial dialect. So I got some real great benefits out of being in the U.S. military. I was on flying status while I was in the U.S. Air Force. I flew on uh, reconnaissance aircraft, the uh, RC, which the R stands for reconnaissance, uh, RC-130. Thirty and RC-135 aircraft, and that's the RC-135 is the old Boeing 707, but uh, I spent uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours flying uh, reconnaissance missions. Uh, both, again, both the Army and the Air Force gave me training, uh, language training, so I was very fortunate to get all of that language training, and I parlayed that eventually while I was over in Berlin, Germany, uh, into a with the University of Maryland that had a branch over in Berlin, Germany at the time. I parlayed uh, all of that training into a bachelor's of art in the Russian language. So I got to not only get all of the great training from the military, but I also uh, got what we would call sweetheart assignments in the military. I was stationed not only three years in Berlin, Germany, and got to eat all that great German food, Wiener Schnitzel and German potato salad and that. But I was stationed twice in Athens, Greece, and got to eat all the good Greek food, tzatziki and all those other good foods there in the Mediterranean area. I got, uh, I was uh, 
temporary duty, what they call in the military TDY. I got to go TDY to Egypt twice and got to see the pyramids and speaks got a chance to try out my Egyptian colloquial language uh, training with uh, some of the, and I love the Egyptian people. They were uh, the ones I met uh, not far from Cairo. Uh, we were uh, at a Cairo West uh, airfield there. Uh, I got to meet quite a few Egyptian people, and again, uh, very, very nice people. I have very fond memories of Egypt. And, of course, I was when I was on flying status, we used to fly into England. We used to fly into Okinawa, Japan. We flew into Alaska, so I got to see almost every uh, state in the United States of America. I got to travel through a lot of them. And uh, I was stationed, again, another nice, very, very nice assignment at the High Desert Plateau at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, which is where the Army has their United States Army uh, intelligence center and school and I taught a couple years as a senior instructor out there so I got well I got to do a, a fair amount of teaching and I love to teach uh, informally and uh, so a couple classes uh, in the military and then I worked uh, six years as a Department of Defense civilian at the Puzzle Palace the National Security Agency so uh, I've got kind of an interesting background, I guess, and uh, and uh, met quite a few interesting people. As a matter of fact, when I was at the Army's Intelligence Center in school, I was the escort officer for four Egyptian general officers. I think two of them were major generals. One was a brigadier. One might have been a lieutenant general. I'm not can't 100% sure on the memory there. But uh, I uh, walked, uh, took these guys around at Fort Huachuca and showed them around and then flew with them back to uh, to Tucson and that when uh, they were finished. But uh, uh, three of them were Muslims and one was a, a Christian. And it was kind of interesting because the Christian guy got me off to the side and he, he was the Brigadier General and he was in logistics or administration, something like that. And he says, Daryl... Uh, I will never make uh, major general. I'll never make, certainly never make lieutenant general. I will never be a high, super high-ranking general because I am a Christian. I've gone as far as they're, uh, as I, they're going to allow me to go to rise in the ranks. And, uh, of course, he was not in combat arms or anything. And I had mentioned this to uh, Brett the other day is that I noticed the same thing. <laughs> In the U.S. military while I was in that, just about every single general that I met in the military, in the Air Force and the Army, but especially the Army, and if they were in combat arms like the armor, the infantry, et cetera, et cetera, they were generally devout Roman Catholics. And we've noticed the same thing with a lot of these people around the current president, Donald Trump, that... A lot of them are very devout Roman Catholics and have been trained at Catholic colleges and universities. So that's kind of an interesting parallel there is that uh, uh, this Christian uh, general in the Egyptian military figured he was, and he probably never did rise above the rank of Brigadier General, and he never got into the, the real tough combat arms like anything like special forces or armor or infantry or artillery. Uh, he was going to be a logistics administrative officer. And I think the same thing kind of happens in the the U.S. military. So I would imagine you fellow heretics probably find that interesting. Sure. And uh, if you are not Catholic or Catholic trained, then at least you are a Freemason or in some or other uh, secret society involved, because otherwise you don't go up the ranks, neither in the military nor in politics nor in the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, that's what them what combines them all together, right? Yeah, right. and it's not only that, but it's also um, in the intelligence community in that you're not going to hold a key position like uh, the director or deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency or of the uh, FBI, the, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. You're just Those guys are generally, they're hand-picked, and they're generally going to be, as Yerk already mentioned, 
they're either going to be a high-level Roman Catholic, uh, like a Knight of Malta, especially a Knight of Malta, or uh, at least a fourth degree or better Knight of Columbus, or they're going to be a high-level Freemason, or in the case of some of them, both. There's some of the people we know that were in, the char- in charge of the Central Intelligence Agency that were both Knights of Malta and high-level, like a 33-degree free Freemason. So yeah, yeah you, have, you have that same combination. Uh, sorry to interrupt you here, Dara, but you have that same combination with George W. Bush. He was a Knight of the Eucharist, and he was a Freemason from Yale University, Skull and Bones. Right, and that I- that is the case, and it's been the case of everything I've looked into in the intelligence community. These people are generally, like you said, they're high-level Freemasons, or they're they're very, very high-level papal knights of various types, but usually you we find, especially with CIA, a lot of Knights of Malta. Yeah. That's for sure. Jesuit-controlled Knights of Malta, we should say. I think almost all of the CIA directors from uh, Dulles on, uh, then you had Colby, of course, in 9-11, you had Tenet, and all these guys, uh, they were all Knights of Malta, high-trained Knights of Malta, right? Right, and not only that, but the the predecessor uh, to that to the CIA was, of course, the Office the of OSS. Strategic Services, yeah. and that was that was a Knight of Malta named William Wild Bill Joseph Donovan. Donovan, and he yep, worked Wild together with, Re- with Reinhard Gehlen, who was the chief officer of the German counterintelligence from the, from the Russian spy <laughs> administration. Let's call him who went over with uh, Operation Paperclip from Europe to the United States of America and founded the Mossad, something a lot of people don't even know. Yeah, And he, of course, was also a fellow Knight of Malta. Yeah. And then we find uh, even uh, 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 in the Russian uh, intelligence uh, with the old Soviet Union, there was a, a guy named Prince Anton Turkle who was also a Knight of Malta and used Jesuits as his courier. So we find the um, papal Rome, Jesuit-controlled papal Rome, running the major intelligence um, organizations during World War II. And and, uh, whenever I talked with Brett the other day, we had mentioned that what we had, and you, I'm sure you all agree with this, we had nothing but another modern inquisition uh, during World War II, because what were the three major groups of people that they slaughtered and butchered and murdered? You had Orthodox Christians, like Russian Orthodox Christians and Serb Orthodox Christians. You, of course, had the six up to six million Jews, but you also had, and a lot of people don't bring this out and mention it, you had a modern inquisition against the Protestant German northern part of Germany with Prussia and the other northern parts of Germany, which were pr- predominantly Protestant, that's what it, where the British and the U- U.S. did a lot of their firebombing, Dresden and other cities where a lot of these were women and elderly and children f- fleeing uh, the Soviet's uh, army, the Red Army, coming uh, from the, uh, the east there, towards them, and uh, they got slaughtered in those cities with the, the fire bombings. and again, they, they went after the predominantly Protestant northern areas of Germany. So in other words, we had a basically, a World War II was a modern inquisition that took on three of the favorite targets of Papal Rome. And uh, do you mind if we say that uh, none of us here is uh, is uh, anti-Catholic as far as any individual goes? Mm-hmm. We are. That's right. We are. Uh, we're against the hierarchy because, as as Brett and I talked about the other day, uh, we're concerned about the fact that about every thirty to fifty years, these folks go on a mass murder spree, and that's the saddest part of it. Is is that. They go after not only thousands, but they go after ten thousands. They go after sometimes hundreds of thousands. When you talk about the Waldensian Christians and that, and the French Huguenots, and that, uh, the Irish Protestants, I think they hit 150,000, killed 150,000 
Irish Protestants, I think, from 1641 to 1649. Uh, they killed 250,000 Dutch Protestants. Uh, the Duke of Alva and that went into what they called the Low Countries, the Netherlands and Belgium and those areas where... Flanders, where what it was called most of the time at that time, yeah. Right, and so they've just got a, a record of mass murder. I call them Mass Murder Incorporated, and that's why we have a concern is we, we like uh, I'm sure some of you, but I, I've got like 90% of my friends and relatives growing up <laughs> were Roman Catholic. Okay, and can I, still can I interrupt you there for a second, Sure. Darryl? Darryl? Just sure. Uh, let, us, let us just manifest what you are just saying, that we don't work against or that we don't have anything against personal Catholics. Let us just uh, emphasize this with the Word of God, with the Bible. When we open the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 6, it says, But this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I, Jesus, also hate. It is not about the hate of people, it's about the hate of doctrines. It's about the hate of the wrong doctrines, because the Nicolaitans at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation is just what the Roman Catholic Church resembles today. Exactly, and it is, 100%. And it, and is, I'm the not deeds, a, it is the deeds that we hate, it is the false doctrine that we hate, But it is not the the people. The people are betrayed souls. And I was I was reading some in a uh, in another video. I'm I'm making a German video series about child abuse of the Roman Catholic Church. And in that I mentioned that too. Because Richard Bennett, who is an article that I read in that, um, uh, it, it's. Um, Uh, Rome persecutes even the little children. Uh, the wolves of Rome persecute little children. Is one of his latest newsletters that you probably also know, Daryl. And I'm reading that in um, in working on this, uh, making a video series about the systematic Catholic Roman Catholic child abuse. And therein, Richard Bennett says um, that we are calling out honest Catholics out of that church. And I just made the. <laughs> made the argument there is no there is no honest Catholic. There are honest people caught in the Roman Catholic trap, but there is no honest Catholic. That's an oxymoron. Yeah? When you're a I Roman Catholic you cannot be honest. But there are honest people trapped in the lie and in the system of the Roman Catholic Church. And those honest people are the people we are speaking to, because those are the people that God addresses in Revelation 18, verse 4, when he says, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you, be not, uh, and that you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. And I think it is very important that we lay the ground stone here, that we make a very distinct that we make the very distinction between the hate of people and the hate of doctrines. Nobody here in our four people call for this moment hates any person, but we hate the doctrines and the false teachings and the false set-up systems, and we are here to expose this with all the power the Holy Spirit imputes into us while we are gathered here together. I think that sums it all up that you wanted to say a little bit, right, Daryl? That's a hundred percent correct because you we ha you, we have to have a love for everybody, and that's a love that uh, uh, and of course Greek's better than English as far as the word love goes because you have three different words as I'm sure you all know you have philo type love you have eros which from which we get the word erotic erotic but you also have agape love. And agape love is the word that the King James Bible, which is, by the way, the the one Bible, if you're an English-believing Christian, you should be reading the old King James Bible. The only But Bible, let's say. A hundred percent. And we can get into that later if you want. But the, the main thing is, is that we're to have that agape love, that charity, charity love, uh, for all people. And that's where Christ the big difference between Muhammad and Christ is that Christ said that we're even to love our enemies. 
And uh, if we think about it, that's not always the easiest thing to do. However, what that word simply means there, to love our enemies, is that we treat them the way we would want to be treated. And having been a 20, in the military for 20 years, I can tell you, if I was a prisoner of war, I would want someone to give me at least the bare minimum of food that was necessary that would give me water to drink, and it would allow me to do some rest and sleep and uh, give me the necessary medical care that I needed, say, like if I was shot in the leg or the arm or something, that they're going to give me the minimal medical care at least. That's what it means to love your enemies, that you would treat them the way you would want to be treated if you were in their shoes in the same situation. And that's something that that the Bible very, very clearly shows. And, of course, the, the story of the Good Samaritan, is a is a perfect example in that but uh, a lot of the religious leaders as we know today they would be the types like the, the priest and the levite that are going to move off to the side of the road and walk on by and let the wounded person lay there and and continue bleed and uh, they're not like the good samaritan that walked by and bound the man's wounds up and took him to the inn and told the innkeeper that uh, when he came back, that he would give him whatever money that he needed to pay for the treatment of the guy and that. So the Lord Jesus Christ really raised the bar there as to, to how, where to even love our enemies. But we're to have that agape love for all people. And, and I believe all of us have a love for Roman Catholics in the sense that we want them to escape uh, a system of enslavement. And a lot of Roman Catholics, if you're dear Roman Catholic listener, if you're listening to this, understand that uh, we care that you may, you're in a system that basically tries to rob you of every cent they can get from you through purgatory, masses for the dead, uh, indulgences, etc., throughout history, uh, if there was ever a church that was trying to reach in the back of your pocket and grab your wallet, it certainly is the, the Roman Catholic Church. Not only that, but through the confessional, trying to get to your your wives and your your daughters and et cetera. They have a terrible history of mistreating women. Uh, of course, now we've seen exploding in in Europe and the United States, in the United States especially all of the the sexual abuse uh which is massive in my area of Pennsylvania we uh, we have a um, the Johnstown Altoona diocese here and uh for years now we've had explosions in the local newspapers of uh, concerning uh, explosive stories i mean uh, we uh, concerning all of the priestly sexual abuse that's going on so we have a heart for Roman Catholics, and I hope Roman Catholics that listeners will understand that, that you're in a system that, again, enslaves you. It's a mind-control system. I studied uh, communism and worked against the old Soviet Union for many years in uh, Air Force and uh, Army intelligence, and I can see that there's many, many ways that, that they enslave people through mind control and... Uh, uh, through all of this uh, sacerdotalism and ceremonialism, uh, <laughs> etc., etc., in the church, and if, and I think we all agree that the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he went around healing people, uh, being kind to people, but there was one group of people that he had a little bit of trouble with, and that was the money changers, because there at least twice in the in the New Testament, the Lord in the Gospels. The Lord Jesus Christ cleansed that temple. He made a, 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 a whip, and he overturned the money changers' tables, and he drove them out of the temple, and he, he saved the nastiest uh, uh, verbal attacks uh, that he ever launched. He saved them for the religious crowd. He called them hypocrites. And he said, um, we're talking about the Pharisees, scribes, and, the scribes and, Pharisees. and Pharisees. I just wanted to mention, don't forget them when you speak about the money changers, because, you know, yeah. the modern money changers are the Jews like the Rothschilds who are put by the Vatican into their power, because as we read the Jewish encyclopedia, um, the Rothschilds are but the guardians of the Vatican treasury, so they don't have any power because it is the owner of the treasure that has any power and not the guardian of that. 
and the money changers at that time, they were just people sitting on the, alt uh, on the altar courts of the temple, making sure that the people who came there, who wanted to sacrifice for their sins, could exchange their uh, currency they had into temple mount money, because, you know, there was a, an own currency that was used in the temple at that time. And, you, and, had to use, and mm. you had to use that money to buy your animals that you were giving to the priest for, sacri uh, for, sac for making sacrifices for your sins. And um, they were put outside of the... Uh, uh, so you, you had an outer part of the temple, and that's where the, uh, where the goyim, where, <laughs> where the pagans were allowed, because the pagans were not allowed on the inner side of the circle. And uh, Jesus um, was against that system because, like this, the scribes and the Pharisees prevented uh, the people who were the quote-unquote unbelieving uh, to come into that system and to come into the temple and to make sacrifices for them for them too to come to the knowledge of the of the truth that that's the problem that he had most of the time with them and right therefore he was of course as you said uh, as you said making a whip against the money changers on one hand but on the other hand the the people that he used the most foul language ever used in the bible against is the scribes and the pharisees yeah uh, yeah. he, he calls them. He calls them uh, a den of vipers, and uh, he, uh, I don't know what names all he has. <laughs> you whited, whited, whited sepulchers. He called yeah. them whited sepulchers. He called them hypocrites like crazy a whole bunch of times. He called them hypocrites yeah. was one of his favorite words to use on them. Snakes, vipers, uh, you name it. The Lord Jesus Christ, the kindest person that uh, that ever walked the earth. Uh, he just had nothing but harsh words for these money changers, by the way. They charged them exorbitant rates to try yeah. to convert their money to the temple currency. So these guys were making money hand over fist. They were just, they were money grabbers, money grubbers, and the Lord recognized that. And, of course, what does the Bible say? It's not that the... Uh, it's not the money that is pure evil or anything. It's the love of money. Yeah, the love it's of money the is the love root of, of all money. evil. Yeah, sure is. But the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, yeah, he just he had nothing but kind of nasty words to say to these folks because they they burdened, as he said, uh, the people with burdens that they themselves wouldn't even lift a finger to try to carry. They gave them so many rules and regulations and their traditions. If that does that remind you of any modern religions? But uh, <laughs> he really nailed them. Probably for, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> he really nailed them for their traditions because he said, "By your traditions, you've made null. Basically, you made the word of God null and void." So the Lord Jesus Christ, he just he was really fed up with that kind of. Uh, I think you could even say that again, Daryl, to emphasize it. By your traditions, you have made the word of God null none and effect. void. To none effect. Yeah, to none effect, right. Yeah, they didn't want to follow God's words. They they had their own traditions. They had their own, and their own traditions were set up in order to control the people, control them to, to take their money, to keep them uh, obedient and uh, worshiping, uh, you know, the, a, a, a religious scholar or, you know, a honoring system. them. Yeah. It's Honoring a system, them, really. Giving more honor to them, these individuals, these religious leaders, than to God. Do we know a modern religion today that does that, that has, you know, cardinals and popes? And uh, we, we brought that up yesterday, Brett, and that's kind of yeah. interesting. And that is, is that when we've all read the Bible, and, and I think you guys agree with me, the King James Bible, and that I don't find any cardinals. I don't find any popes. Uh, I don't even find archbishops, but what I do find is uh, a bishop slash elder, which is basically an overseer, and that's what the Apostle Paul was. He was more an evangelist, but he was a missionary. He was an overseer in the sense of being an elder slash bishop and deacon. Those are the only two offices, elder slash bishop and deacon, that are in the Bible, and the Apostle Paul and I think it's in one of the B Timothy books, and it's in one of the uh, b books of the Thessalonians. He gives the qualifications of a bishop, and what is it? It isn't being celibate. It's the qualifications are is being the husband of one wife, the husband of one wife, which means they must be married, and having their children, you know, under the control. 
so where did priestly celibacy come from? You know, and where did a lot of the other doctrines come from? There's no purgatory in the Bible. There's mm-hmm. no goddess worship in the Bible. The only <clears throat> goddess worship that's mentioned in the Bible, as you're all aware of, is the worshiping the Queen of Heaven in the book of Jeremiah, and it's a negative thing. It's not a positive thing. Mary was one of the most wonderful ladies, women in the world, but she wasn't the mother of God. She was the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ's physical body. She was not the mother of God. And so we've got in the the Roman Catholic Church actually spitting on a lot of Christian, true Christian doctrine, the biblical doctrine, by having a a, a pope being the vicar of Christ, uh, having the pope called Holy Father, by having Mary and the saints and the priest himself being intercessors when we're told in the Bible that there's only one mediator between God and and men, and that's mankind, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no place for a priest to be the mediator. There's no place for a priest to take your auricular confession or any of that. So, again, we're not being mean to Roman Catholics. We're trying to tell you, look at the Bible. Look to the Bible and search the Scriptures as, as, as the Lord Jesus Christ did because he told them, search the scriptures, because they are the ones that the Bible is what speaks of me. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the Bible. He's clearly the Bible. And that's why we, we need to follow what Christ said. We don't need to follow what man says. And the only time that we pay any attention to what a man says is if it squares with the Holy Bible. That's the ruler. That's the the standard by which we we are supposed to measure everything. And and uh, I think we were talking yesterday, the other day, about Thanksgiving, the things that we're thankful for, and we're thankful that we have the Bible in our hands, because I'm sure you guys have all seen the picture of the guy with a ter- terrified look on his face, because he's, he's sitting there, and they've got the Bible open, in front of them, and I don't. I guess that's his wife yeah. or his daughter or something. But you've seen the picture; yeah. they have a look of oh, terror yeah. on their face. It's the knock on the door because, oh, how dare they have the Holy Bible in their vernacular, their local language, to read? Because the Roman Catholic Church, for, for many, many, many years, and David W. Daniels has a wonderful book which Yerk has, I believe, read, and that's uh, on there. Is did the Catholic Church give us the Bible? And that very much points out. All of the, the measures, the, the, the things that the Roman Catholic Church did to keep uh, people from printing Bibles, from distributing Bibles, from translating Bibles into the local vernacular, the local language, uh, they only allowed Bibles for centuries to be a few Bibles to exist in Latin, and then it was the Roman Catholic uh, Vulgate, but uh, that was only for scholars to use. But the, the local peasant, farmer, whatever, he wasn't supposed to have the Bible in his hands because, don't you know, you can, you know, we've been told that we can't understand the Bible and we need someone to interpret it for us uh, yeah. if we're ever to understand it. And no, no, the Bible tells us to search <clears throat> the Scriptures and to study God's Word, and the Bible interprets itself. Even the book of Revelation, which we're we were told for centuries by the Roman Catholic Church that we couldn't understand. Well, they didn't want us looking at the, they call it apocalypse, but they didn't want us looking at the book of Revelation, because if anyone really studied the book of Revelation in in a Bible that was decently translated, they would see that uh, there was somebody that was fitting the identification of the Antichrist, and, of course, that was the office of the papacy, and there was somebody that fit the description of the harlot or the whore that was described in Revelation, sitting on seven hills whose, whose colors are purple and scar- scarlet. Hmm, what colors do the bishops and the cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church wear? Well, okay, their colors I, are purple and scarlet. Can I interrupt you for a second, Daryl? Sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sometimes it's just hard to get something in between the flow of your speech, which is wonderful that you can speak the freely, that uh, that wonderfully, that filled with the spirit. But I, I just want to go back a little bit to uh, what you were speaking about the bishops. 
and also to uh, and I do that also to make uh, sure to the people when we read the Bible on this, it is to be found in First Timothy chapter three. Um, it is very important that the Roman Catholic Church already abuses this quote unquote system of bishopric by establishing a hierarchy that Jesus Christ never established. The elder of a church that was to be an office and no title with a hierarchy where he stands above somebody else. His office was a leading office, but that person was none to be looked upon. And it was regularly to change also, yeah, one elder to the other. So if we, uh, let, let me just open the Bible here. I've just prepared this here. I, I looked it up in my King James that I have here and we can read along because I put this here on the, on the screen. Everybody can read along with this in First Timothy chapter three. It says, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now, what does that say with the Roman Catholic Church? Are there any bishops <laughs> today in their office who desire really a good work, in good work in relation to the word of God, the God, the God of the Bible, not the little God in Rome? That's a question somebody has to ask himself first. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, nor striker, not greedy or filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well in his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now how can he have his children in subjection when he doesn't have children because he's not allowed to be married? For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with the pride he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be, uh, be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre holding the mystery of the faith and a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. It continues. And you brought it. It continues you in brought verse, out yeah, in, in verse 13. Yeah, sorry. It continues in verse 13 and says, For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Jesus Christ. Yeah? Um, I just want to end here. I don't have to read the whole chapter. It's, it's just a few verses longer. But I think I make my point. So when you are part of a church that forbids you to marry, how can you as a bishop be the husband of one wife? How can you be the father of children in your own household? And how can you prove that you have your own household under control and then being given the responsibility for a quote-unquote flock? Yeah? That's and, a very interesting question and a, a Roman Catholic should ask himself. So please... Uh, Continue, Daryl. I didn't want to interrupt you there, but I think this point of being a bishop was a, a very interesting point that you made there, and that is one of the points how you can easily, um, how you can easily uh, unveil the cover the Roman Catholic Church throws above it, and that you can see that it is not biblical, and that's and the most important point. Right, and look at uh, all the problems that uh, this priestly celibacy has has led to, because number one is, it's totally against nature uh, for a man. Uh, the, the only one that we knew that ever pulled this off uh, in that position was the Apostle Paul. Yeah, let me, let uh, me interrupt you there. He speaks about, mm -hmm. uh, at a certain part in the New Testament, he speaks about the eunuchs. And he speaks of three kind of eunuchs that there are. And that's something most people don't understand. How do you mean three kind of eunuchs? Well, there are those who are born eunuch because of a natural, just, let's say, error in <laughs> when they are born, that they are just born as a eunuch without anything they can do about it. And there are those eunuchs which are made eunuchs by man. And 
we used to call them castrates, you know, and eunuchs who were uh, bereaved of their manhood by other men. It was not their choice. Yeah, they used these castrates for singing, for example. They still use them in the, in the Roman Catholic Church, by the way. And then there are eunuchs of choice, like the Apostle Paul was one. Uh, in difference to the Apostle Peter, who was married, who had a wife. But Paul chose not to be married, but it was his plain choice. And you can only do this with the help of the Holy Spirit. Now the problem with the Roman Catholic Church, a uh, <laughs> quote-unquote eunuchs, <laughs> celibacy is, that they don't have the Holy Spirit. They are led by another spirit. That spirit won't help them. That's the problem. But you have three kinds of eunuchs. Natural born, made by men, and made by the help of the Spirit. And the last one is the one that Paul speaks about. You know, And that is not everybody, not everybody can do that. And if you can't do that, well, then go. Look for a wife. But right. for a, Again, for a biblical men, wife. It puts both men and women in very unnatural positions. And mm -hmm. a lot of this has been brought out. Uh, Richard Bennett uh, uh, edited a book, uh, I think it was 20 Nuns, uh, that give their testimony, and uh, the nuns, their testimony very clearly shows that these women are, were in very unnatural, and still some, the nuns are still in these in unnatural positions of not having husbands, not having children, and it's led to all kinds of problems, of course, uh, uh, monasteries and seminaries, etc. Uh, there have been good Roman Catholic writers that have, uh, have exposed uh, the massive problems that they've got and especially in the United States here with the, the seminaries and that, with uh, homosexuality, pedophilia, et cetera, et cetera, is, it's, it's rampant. It's at what we would say epidemic. And uh, there have been good Catholics that have written books. I had a book by, I believe it was William H. Kennedy, uh, Lucifer's Lodge, Satanic Ritual Abuse in the Roman Catholic Church. And William H. Kennedy made an interesting statement uh, and I don't have that book handy right now, but the, the, the fact of the matter is he made an interesting statement. He said as bad as the, the, the priestly abuse of boys in the Catholic Church was, he, he thought that the abuse of women was probably even greater. And, the, and we're talking about the abuse of, of not only regular lay persons and that women through the confessional, etc., but also nuns. So that a lot of the nuns, he had written in his book that a lot of the nuns had reported sexual abuse by a superior or by, you know, a, a priest, someone or another religious, they call them religious, uh, in um, the nuns' orders and that. Uh, they had been abused by either another, uh, by a female or by a, a priest. And uh, Ch Charles Chinicky brought that out quite a bit in his book, The Priest, the Woman, and the Confessional, and uh, like I said, we've had uh, courageous Roman Catholics who have spoken out about this terrible abuse, not only of boys, but also of women and girls uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. And as I said, in my, I live in south-central Pennsylvania, and we just, this uh, Johnstown Altoona uh, diocese, just uh, the papers for the last couple of years have just been full of story after story. Now, not of hardly any of them, have, I don't think, have gone to jail, and we can't even get the statute of limitations changed in Pennsylvania. Uh, so these guys basically, they their names may make it into the paper that they abuse 200 boys, but they never go to jail. They see, always seem to, a lot of the judges, a lot of the prosecutors, and that have either sheriffs, uh, police chiefs, and that have been bought off, told to shut up, not say anything. So, But fortunately, it did finally get into the papers. And so we've had quite a, uh, uh, quite a stir here in Pennsylvania concerning the, the tremendous amount of sexual abuse by priests. And uh, to a lesser degree, but still quite a bit amongst, you know, the monks and the friars and at the various religious orders. But priestly sexual abuse has really, really, really come to the fore here uh, in the state of Pennsylvania and, and in a lot of other parts of the United States and of America. And here in Europe, too, Daryl. Here in Europe, too. Yeah. 
there have been made excavations in uh, in the quote unquote gardens of monasteries of nuns where they found mass graves up to 800 children buried over there in Ireland. And they, that's, there were and that's also of something that Richard Bennett speaks about because sure. he's Irish in his roots. He speaks about that. And of course there the book The Priest, The Woman and the Confessional, the picture I just have here in my video right now, I put this in here by Charles Chinnikwe, is a very, very interesting book in, in, in that regard. It speaks about the abuse the Roman Catholic Church does through the confessional because the priest is actually taking the position of the husband of the wife. Uh, he gets her trust and uh, he gets her most deep, deepest secrets, he gets to know her most deepest secrets, something she wouldn't even share with her husband, she shares with her priest. So what does that the, make the priest? The confidant, right? The exactly. Only, the only one she trusts in. And by this the Roman Catholic Church has a wonderful um, uh, um, how do you say, um, a wonderful tool uh, to break up the biblical marriage and by that to infiltrate the family and by infiltrating the family to break up the family unit uh, the family union and this family the family unit is the smallest unit of a society that we have and when you break that down you break down the foundations of the whole society especially when you have a biblical society and that's what the Jesuits did for example with this um, Externalization of the hierarchy. Uh, these quote unquote Ten Commandments that came out of the United Nations that were written by, um, uh, what's her name again? Um, Alice Bailey. Alice Bailey, thank you. Yeah, I've just, I, 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 I just lost the name. By Alice Bailey. Oh, and I made, I, I can't I, forget I, that one. I made, I made two or three videos about that, you know, the externalization of the hierarchy. Uh, for five or six hours speaking on that subject and how they broke up, uh, how, how the Roman Catholic Church came into the family unit and uh, they did that with divorce and they did that with quote-unquote children's rights which is going on rampant the day of today. Uh, not that children don't have any rights but first and for all uh, the Bible says that children should obey and um, uh, and uh, be faithful to their father and their mother. That's something the Roman Catholic Church completely takes away. And when they break up the uh, smallest social unit a, a community has, the family, the whole community breaks apart, breaks into pieces. And that's what they are working on. That's what they need. They want their priests to be the leaders of the nations. They, they don't want their husband to be the husband of one wife and they don't want the wife to listen to her husband and they don't want the children listen to the wife and the husband. They want them all listening to the Roman Catholic hierarchy. Be that through, a, uh, through the school system, be that through the church system, be that through the, um, through the working system or whatever. And today they are just using the modern priest with their uh, social, um, social media Facebook and all that stuff, and this is the best confessional the Roman Catholic Church could ever think of. <laughs> the people are now not going into the confessional, but they are giving everything away for freely in this uh, in, in these uh, social media like Facebook and yep. Twitter and and what, what what are they all called? You know, YouTube even. And YouTube, yeah, they they get it all handed over on a silver planner today. <laughs> yeah. The new voluntarily, yeah. voluntarily. I mean, this is just this is just crazy. But this is how this is how the devil works. You know, he makes it so attractive. Oh, this is such a good thing. Uh, you see, you have this advantage and that advantage, and people and just forget, stop thinking. And don't forget that um, not only does the confessional it serves several purposes, as you're well aware of. I'm sure all of you are. And that is number one is it does it does break down the family. And that, but it also serves as someone who spent 26 years in the United States intelligence community. I have to tell you that uh, the confessional is the greatest intelligence gathering system in the world. Uh, the CIA, the Mossad, all put together for hundreds and hundreds of years 
nowhere comes close to matching the intelligence gathering capability through the confessional booth, the confessional box. Uh, when you think that you have kings, princes, princesses, queens, admirals, generals, and their children, and their sweethearts, their daughters, all confessing their most intimate, personal sins to this priest. And, of course, the Jesuits have loved to have been, that's their, one of their favorite things, is to be lenient father confessors, to have all of these secrets available to you. Imagine that power that that gives you for fomenting wars, revolutions, um, et cetera, et cetera, controlling a, uh, the, the military of a certain country. A wonderful example, sorry, Daryl, to interrupt you. A wonderful sure. example for that is um, the uh, Jesuit confession father of uh, Louis XIV, Louis XIV, the French king, who is responsible for the, for the revoking of the Edict of Nantes in eight, uh, 1685. And his Jesuit uh, um, uh, confessor... I believe his name was La Chaise. ...was uh, La Chaise, yeah. And, and how did he achieve that? Well, the king was telling him secrets that he had fornicated with a niece of him and all that stuff. And La Chaise said, I'm sorry, king, your sin is so incredible strong i cannot forgive you i cannot give you absolution on that sin you have to live with that you are going to purgatory i can't do anything about it this is so horrible no way that can be forgiven and he worked on that king on and on by he wanted forgiveness for that and and then all of a sudden la chaise said and let me just let me just go for a picture here because i have la chaise here in the picture um, he said, okay, King, there's one way how you can be forgiven. And how was that? Well, when you revoke the Edict of Nantes, which protected the Huguenots, the Protestants in the south of France, from religious persecution. Um, that was, uh, the Edict of Nantes was installed by King Henry IV of France in the 1590s, a little time after we had the Bartholomew Massacre of 1572. And um, King Henry IV, by the way, and I know that you know that, Daryl, because you spoke about that in the past, he was um, assassinated by a, uh, by a Jesuit. But he uh, brought in the Edict of Nantes, and that gave religious freedom to the Huguenots in the south of France, so that they could actually pursue their religious beliefs, which were the beliefs of the Bible. And La Chaise used this uh, on the king, and by telling the king well, you can persecute those heretics, those Protestants, because they are already dead, because they are outside of the Roman Catholic Church. And according to the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, there is no salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church. Thus, he told the king, they are dead already. You just put them out of their misery of this um, material life where they are in right now. And that's how Louis XIV revoked the Edict of Nantes in 1685, by the um, power of Père Lachaise, his confessor. And this is only one example. And this is very important that we understand this. This is only an example of a confessor of a leader. The Jesuits were always found of being the confessors of the leaders of the country, as Daryl just mentioned, the kings, the princesses, the dukes, uh, the barons, um, the emperors, what, whatever you had, and all their family. But also, the Roman Catholic priest, the normal priest, was to have all the confessions on the confessional box in this little par in his little parish that he worked on. And by that, they had the most uh, the finest uh, intelligence system all over the world. And today they are given that on a silver platter by this quote-unquote social media that we have today. This is just the modern confessional box without the people recognizing it, giving away anything. I mean, you can't do a stroke on the computer today without the NSA knowing it. And they are listening into this conversation also. We are sure about that. But let them. We are not fearful of them. <laughs> we you know, it's really interesting about that, you guys, if you don't mind me uh, making a point. Sure. Is that uh, you have this, uh, you also have this uh, 
social uh, condition right now called uh, internet dating. And you make your own profiles, put your pictures up and all that stuff. I mean, I used to do that for years. And it is just, it's just horrible. But I mean, that's the perfect example of giving away everything. You know, you put yourself out there. You give you, you know, this is what I'm into. This is what I do. Da, 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 da. You got it all right there. That's even worse today with the smartphones where they post on Facebook every dump they do on the toilet, by way of speaking. I'm sorry for the <laughs> chosen word, but that's exactly what yeah. it is. You know? Yeah, they, right. They share absolutely everything. There is no secrecy right. in anything anymore, especially since these smartphones are constantly connected to the Internet. Yep. Yeah. They, they are giving it to the Roman Catholic Church on a silver platter. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But um, let's continue and hear what uh, Daryl has to say. I just got to go away for two minutes. You have to excuse me, but please go on, Daryl, and uh, take a little bit of wh what we just said here and give your own sure, opinion on and, that. And it was interesting that you brought up uh, your, as he leaves, uh, uh, that um, the Nicolaitans is an interesting term. That's the, the Lord Jesus Christ said in the book of Revelation that he hated the deeds and the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, and some Bible scholars have tried to say, oh, this must have been a special group that of people, um, it was a special grouping. No, I mean, the Greek word itself explains what he's talking about, Nicolaitans, uh, it, Nico, where we get the, the word, the Nike shoes and all that stuff, but it means to conquer or to, to lord yourself over or to, to be the, uh, the ruler or whatever. And Overseer, we, yeah. Yep, and we get the word laity, Nicolaitan, so the oh, laity, wow. so he who rules or rules over or harshly over the laity, and that's the hierarchical Roman Catholic system very clearly falls into certainly that category of having a system where you've got people in elevated positions, whether it's a monsignor, whether it's a bishop, archbishop, a cardinal, a pope, uh, that's ruling over the people and in an elevated position. And, of course, if you get to the level of the Pope, where he actually claims to be God on earth. So it's a, it's a system that it's not like the, the Bible with true Christians, where we're all brothers and sisters. No, no, no. The, the, you have a special priestly class that's elevated over the people and that the people are to, to uh, bow down to and kowtow to and um, to take care of and provide for, etc. Uh, so uh, the Lord Jesus Christ very clearly, knowing everything, uh, explained what bad religion was, and he, he certainly nailed it, and he had, again, uh, when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will see that he saved his greatest venom the nastiest words he had were for the religious leaders who were, through their tradition, again, making null and void the Word of God. So the Bible is what we're to exalt. We're not to exalt man's traditions, and we're not to exalt man. And we're not to call some man on earth uh, Father. The Lord Jesus Christ specifically said not to do that, and yet they not only call the Pope Father, but they call him Holy Father, a title that Jesus Christ only used when addressing his heavenly Father, was the only time we see that Holy Father used, and it's not, it's not a man. And so that's, again, um, we're telling uh, Roman Catholics that take a look at how many things your church does that does not square with the Bible. And that's what the whole, the whole idea of the Reformation was was uh, let's get back to Scripture and let's base our, quote, religion on what the Bible says, not on what man says. And that's, uh, as we mentioned yesterday, uh, it's summed up in basically three phrases in that, and that is our salvation comes by God's grace alone, and it's through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, and based upon Holy Scripture alone. That's where the terms sola scriptura, and that, and you know, of course, they say the same, grace alone, faith alone, 
and by the, the the Holy Bible, by Scripture alone, that we base these things on. Because if if everybody has a different yardstick or ruler that they're using to measure things, or a different system of weights and measures uh, for weighing out their potatoes or their tomatoes and everything, if everybody's using what they want to without any standards, well, then you're going to get a lot of error and you're going to get a lot of uh, uh, crookery and uh, stealing. Oh, exactly. And, you know, it's the denominational system that's been foisted upon the people. This, this, uh, this is what uh, Jesus was talking about, Matthew 23, by binding heavy burdens, I believe. Oh, you're a hundred percent correct, and and we would urge, and all of us, all, all four of us are are strong believers in following what the Bible says, and we would urge you to read read chapter twenty three of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. Just sit down and and as hopefully grab a if you're an English speaker, grab a King James Bible. That it, it's the King James is very easy to understand, especially in the New Testament. Translation, I, I recorded especially that some the gospel, ago, right? Yes, yes, you I, did, I Yerk, and I'm using it in a Brett. video soon. Yeah, yeah. chapter 23 yeah. and chapter 24 of Matthew, uh, very important. Listen, very. Um, there, there, there's a very easy uh, little quote the Bible says, uh, which sums it up everything that we have just said here. By their fruits, you will know them. But the problem is that the people today don't look at the fruits of the people anymore because they hide their fruits and. If you want to see their fruits, their real fruits of their work, you have to dig and you have to look behind the curtain. And that is what people just don't do. They don't want to look behind the curtain. They don't want to see that all the people that are placed in front of our eyes are just actors, puppets on a string, and they don't want to see the, st the, the, the guy who pulls the strings, or the guys who pull the strings. And... Um, Listen, we have come for this recording to almost an hour and I, I, I want to finish this up because I don't want to put a video out that is more uh, longer than an hour because I know that the average attention span cannot cope with more than an hour <laughs> paying attention to this. But um, that would be something very interesting maybe to talk next time about, Daryl. Uh, I think sure. that you agree with me that we were that w then we would include... Um, uh, uh, one of your most famous presidents over the United States of America, mm. um, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who himself, by the way, was, the fourth, was, was a fourth degree knight of Columbus. Um, but he held a speech about secret societies in 1961, and he was speaking about a ruthless, monolithic conspiracy. And to tell the people how he, with these words, completely only addressed the Jesuit order. And then we can go into a discussion about the Jesuit order with their founding in 1534 uh, in Montmartre and Sacré-Cœur churches in Paris and their ordination in 1540 by Antichrist Paul III with the papal Breve or Bull. There's a dispute about that, whether it's a bull or, or just a brief. Regimini Militantes Ecclesiae, and we can go into that subject and the subject of um, John F. Kennedy and everything around there. Would you be interested in doing uh, another interview on that, Daryl? Maybe tomorrow afternoon, if you have the time. Certainly, 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 because as we had, Brett and I talked about the other day, is that through the Lincoln assassination and through the assassination of JFK, we get to see a picture of how uh, Papal Rome and the Jesuits uh, work through their priests and uh, uh, their lackeys and that within uh, government, within the military, within the intelligence communities to murder somebody. And boy, the, 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 as we mentioned, the, uh, yes, I think it was yesterday, mm. we mentioned that um, the footprints or the fingerprints of the Jesuits in Papal Rome are all over the assassinations of Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy, through especially the Knights of Malta that were involved in the cover-up, mm -hmm. the cover-up of the JFK assassination. There is just so much evidence, and we mentioned uh, several of the books, uh, The Suppressed Truth About the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, Rome's Responsibility for the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, respectively written by Burke McCarty and by Brigadier General Thomas M. Harris. 
There's plenty of evidence out there. If people are willing to take even a cursory look at it, they're going to see that the Jesuits in Papal Rome were responsible for taking out, for murdering two, at least two U.S. presidents. But uh, especially, they killed they killed many more. And um, yes. I, I was going through that in in the series of Bill Hughes behind the door. Um, who mentions uh, Harrison and Taylor mm -hmm. and Buchanan. Um, yes, right. At least these three, and of course then you have um, uh, Abraham Lincoln and you have uh, John F. Kennedy, but there were more than these five. Um, of course, so uh, if, if that's fine for you, um, uh, Daryl, then we would come back to you about uh, the same time tomorrow, which for you, of course, is in the morning. I'm saying afternoon because here we have uh, 5.30 now, about 5.30. We are seven hours ahead of you, and then we would come back tomorrow. And um, I would really like to continue this conversation and go a little bit deeper into the Jesuit order, which is very interesting. But on the other hand, I found it very uh, interesting that today we were going into um, the study of the Bible also because first and for all we all have to know our Bible and of course uh, the point that you made uh, via David W. Daniels and his work did the Catholic Church give us the Bible um, the only true Bible in the English language that, he, that we can rely on today is the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. And via the subjects that we are going to talk tomorrow about, we can go into the gunpowder plot, the Babington plot, the Spanish Armada, all the stuff that you have already talked about with Brett, I know, because this is so important to understand the workings of the Jesuits. And I thank you very much, Daryl, for uh, being an attendee today on this call that on the short notice uh, you could make it and you could give us your insights and a little bit about your curriculum and, and, and your way through life. I'm very grateful that you came here and I want to give now the microphone for the last few minutes to you, Daryl, then to Brett and then to Michael um, to finish up the call for today. Thank you very much on my behalf already, Daryl. And I just want to say it's, it's an honor to be on with you three gentlemen Uh, to be on with uh, fellow Christians that are not only proclaiming the Christ, but are also exposing the Antichrist. That's critical, and, and we we'll give a kudo to Tom Fress, because he's put mm -hmm. out a lot of great information on his Inquisition update at that. So we've had people that, uh, throughout history who have risked their lives to tell the truth about Papal Rome. We've had individuals that gave their lives, like uh, William Tyndale, Uh, Cranmer, uh, Latimer, Ridley. We need to remember that people not only have risked their lives, but they've given their lives uh, to try to get Bibles into people's hands, as we've mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, that they have risked their lives to, to, so that we can have that Bible in our hands to read it, to have God's words in our hands. So we need to remember it's key and important that we support Uh, ministries like Chick Publications and David W. Daniels and his fine work and Richard Bennett and his fine work, uh, BrianBeacon.org uh, and Chick.com. Uh, I'd urge everyone to support these people and to get their books. And uh, that book, Did the Catholic Church Give Us the Bible? That is a tremendous book. Chick.com. Go up and, uh, if you don't have a copy of that illustrated book, Uh, he's got two versions out. I think the latest one is like 2013, and that book just gives you a tremendous history of the Bible. So you see the price that was paid to get that book into our hands. So anyway, God bless you, gentlemen, and what a what an honor again and a pleasure to be on with you folks. Brett, Th you're going to say yes, something? Yes, thank you. Thank you guys for, for helping uh Keep the uh, the study going into the Bible, into current events that are so confusing for people to sort out because of the media, because of the false doctrine, because of the entertainment, because of all of the completely steamrolled uh, ideology, all of this crap that gets in the way of finding the truth and sorting this out and getting to this uh, great exodus that is going to happen 
And we must prepare. All of us must prepare. It's vital that we get our Bibles open. It's bi- it's vital that we ask the spirit of the living God and we present ourselves, as it says in Romans 12, as a living sacrifice, as our reasonable service for our brethren, that we just give up on our current uh, path of, of uh, self-gratification. And, and as hard as that is to do, we can do it. And we can come to the knowledge of the truth, and we we can meet our Lord Jesus in the air when he comes. And we know that this false system is going to go, and we can't get rid of it. It is beyond our abilities. And uh, we're struggling in our families, we're struggling in our flesh, but our spirit is here with the Lord. And um, with that, I'll close it up for my end and uh, hand it over to Michael. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Jörg. And thank you very much, Daryl, for your time. And I'd like to add some uh, finishing comments from my side. Because uh, if I'm taking into account your military career, then I find it uh, very intriguing that the Roman Catholic Church also uses their specific hierarchy, which is not biblical in any way, because in Acts Uh, I think it's uh, chapter 10, verses 26. It's uh, written that Peter took Cornelius up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. So, if you see that the leading disciple of Jesus also claims himself to be just only a human being, then I find it very, very, very intriguing that the Roman Catholic Church hierarchy is similar to any hierarchy of, a, of an army, which is, uh, w- there is installed the Pope as the general, and the cardinals, the bishops, the priests, etc., etc. And for me, that uh, w- in the past was one of the most concluding evidences that there cannot be anything really happening in a biblical way in the Roman Catholic Church, because there are so many people... Um, which are not in a biblical way preaching the word of God, but they like to be exalted. Like, for example, in Isaiah 14, 12, where Lucifer wants to be exalted himself. And so that, for me, that was quite a coincidence. If, uh, As you were introducing yourself with your military career and the general, etc., etc., I find it very much important to me to get the understanding that in the in the real church of Christ, we are only followers, humble followers of our real Lord Jesus Christ. A big That's amen it. to that. Okay, thank you for all your three statements, and I hope that the public who watched this enjoyed it, and we are going to see you next uh, back next time. And in the meantime, study your Bible. For English-speaking people, the authorized version of the 1611 King James Version. Only that is the way how you can to get to know the real God, the creator God of this earth and his son who came down to this earth to give his life for all of us, a ransom. And he became sin for us. Just study your Bible. Maranatha. <laughs>